Hi everyone, it is Tuesday, I am Tuesday, and I'd like to apologize to everyone up front because I kinda buried the lead here. Batman took first billing because, I mean, he's Batman, that dude has really good agents. But I'm mostly going to be talking about the theater and postmodern part of the title, broadly comparing the evolution of late 19th and 20th century plays to comic book history in a vain and likely ill-fated attempt to make my college degree feel meaningful. Speaking of the end of meaning, postmodern self-referentialism. You know it. I know it. It might not have been what you were expecting, but I invite you to stick around anyway, because it has a fundamental stranglehold on our entire pop media landscape. Yay. Also, uh, here's a content warning for some of the subjects I'll be talking about today. If you don't want to interact with any of this type of stuff, that's cool. I get that. Just click here to the middle of the video, and I'll lighten up the tone a bit. As always, please like and subscribe. Alrighty? Let's go. Formed in 1954, following a wave of public outcry and general anxiety over a government shutdown, the Comics Code Authority was a non-governmental, self-censoring body designed to curb depictions of violence, sex, and other amoral behaviors in the comic book industry. Despite remaining in effect until January of 2011, the CCA had effectively lost most of its power by the early 80s, following a series of updates and resolutions, creating loopholes and a general slackening of enforcement of the more stringent standards. Enter The Dark Knight Returns. Written by Frank Miller, it is generally considered to be one of the best Batman stories ever written, and helped usher in a new era for DC Comics, much darker and more violent. This led to the 90s extreme. Superman died and the fridging trope got its name. Everything was bigger, bloodier, and even more depressing, with beloved characters being axed and crowbarred simply for shock value. By the time it was all over, people were tired of the slog, tired of opening a comic book and walking away sad. The form had to be reinvented. Keep the violence, the mature themes, but cut out the slog. Batman could still sit on rooftops brooding, but now there needed to be a character commenting on how he broods too much, how theatric depression is his defining character trait. The darkness can still be there, but it has to be undercut by a quip, an ironic gesture followed by a wink and a nod to the audience to show that the author is self-aware. Angels in America Part 1 Millennium Approaches, premiering in 1991 and written by Tony Kushner, follows an ensemble cast of characters in 1980s New York, and deals heavily with the effects of the AIDS epidemic. It's visceral and heart-wrenching. Never before had Broadway goers been able to watch a man shit blood on stage, and is sprinkled with just enough irony to make it palatable. A prime example of this would be the final scene of the show, when Pryor, dying in his bed, watches an angel crash through his ceiling and descend upon the earth. In a melodrama or a musical, this would have been triumphant, a glorious showstopper intended to wow the audience and get them hyped for more. Of course, in those types of shows, this moment would have taken place right before the intermission instead of at the end, though this is technically a midpoint of the story. It, initial audiences had to wait a whole year for the conclusion. The point still stands. Prior comments on the grandeur by saying, very Steven Spielberg, at once explaining the significance of the imagery to the audience while at the same time ironically undercutting what is supposed to be a bombastic and serious moment. Welcome then to postmodern storytelling, where everything exists as a self-referential deconstruction while in later iterations being aware of the fact that everything exists as a self-referential deconstruction. Confused yet? Good. Let's take a moment to figure out how we got here. We don't tend to see this in previous works. If there's a big moment, it stands on its own two legs. Take the ending of Hedda Gobbler. I promise this is interesting. Backed into a corner with no recourse but down, Hedda uses the remaining of her father's two pistols to shoot herself, finally ending an existence she had seen as a slowly cinching torment, strangling her from the day she was born. Brack, 
has a similar moment to Pryor, commenting on the show-stopping event, but with a much different context. People don't do such things, is a shocked and outraged statement at the discovery of Hedda's suicide, a quip to be sure, but removed from the comedic context often associated with such a device in the modern day. Here, it helps to enforce the general dirge of the show so far, explaining the tragedy of Hedda's existence and end. In this time, suicide is unthinkable, so examine the extreme forces at play in order to make someone consider and then follow through with such an act. Like Batman mid-90s, Hedda's drama needs to be rubbed under the audience's noses. The despair helps prop up and is a major factor of the point. No doubt, Pryor's life is depressing, but it doesn't really come to the same level of bleakness as Hedda's. Sure, his boyfriend left him in his hour of need to hit on some Mormon dude, and his family is missing, presumed dead, and he's dying of an incurable disease, and he's possibly had a schizophrenic break, but at least the ghosts of his male ancestors are talking to him. Plus, an angel is calling him the prophet, so that's cool. One can see how this setup endears itself to comedy, despite being decidedly horrific, but it's being used to make the audience connect with the character in a very different way than to Hedda. Her life has to feel abysmal, without much joy in viewing due to the context of her downfall and the time period in which the play was written. If the contemporary audience had felt happy while watching her, the ending could have been less impactful. But Pryor's story comes after a century of progress in theatrical storytelling. 90s audiences don't need a constant reminder of his suffering, even though they get a lot of it, in order to connect with him. They expect, in a sense, to be tormented by his pain, so having that happen would simply be a realization of expectations, and thus feel less impactful. But by undercutting these dire circumstances with comedy, audiences are able to take a new perspective. Pryor commenting he's the 34th Pryor and then being corrected by his ancestor, Pryor, that he's only the 32nd prior is funny, but it also makes the audience connect with the character's emotional turmoil and tragic circumstance. It's an expansion on what Dee Dee and Gogo endure in Waiting for Godot. Their lot is similarly bleak and is interjected with a similar amount of absurdism. They constantly consider killing themselves, but never do. Go off on tangents straight out of vaudeville bits. and generally have a decidedly bad time. Like Batman post-90s, the darkest points of their tragedy is earmarked by points of irony, but it doesn't go so far as to make the audience connect with their characters, only enough to understand them. Vladimir and Estragon exist in this shadow realm, where the universe laughs at, but not with them. Any nods to the audience, while still intentional, are not made intentionally by the characters. They live in a tragedy while the audience watches a comedy. With Pryor, however, this dynamic is turned on its head. From the audience's perspective, his life is abhorrent. However, from Pryor's perspective, as he lays dying, his life just becomes more absurd. This is, of course, intentional. Kushner, not that one. Puppet looking ass. There we go. That's better. <sighs> Tony Kushner has said that Millennium Approaches is supposed to blow up the lives of everyone involved, but the way he goes about it should be noted. Communing with the dead, speaking to others through dreams, having an angel descend from heaven on high, these are mostly taken seriously in fantasy and myth, and are a far cry from the well-to-do noble woman shooting herself in the parlor. At the same time, they become necessary to effectively tell the story. Much like the backlash to the 90s extreme in comics, by the time Angels came around, audiences had long since become tired of watching a depression procession on stage. If Pryor's story had simply been him coming to terms with the fact he was dying of AIDS, it would have been impactful, but not necessarily memorable. The way Kushner went about it made the story feel new. To all the people that skipped ahead, welcome back. All of that stuff you skipped over was 30 years ago. 
Today, we live in a world where ironic self-subversion is commonplace. Tony Stark throws quips on the big screen. Jim Halpert turns knowingly to camera on the small. To say the market is oversaturated would be an understatement, and already we can see a waning interest in the postmodern meta-narrative. One of the biggest complaints levied against the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that nothing can ever be done. Everything is a reference to some other previous project while simultaneously setting up some new thing in the future, all while constantly quipping about how tired certain narrative devices are. It's not enough to know a superhero movie is going to end with a big laser shooting up into the sky. Now, characters have to joke about how everybody uses the big laser, and everybody expects the big laser, and then the big laser still shows up anyway. Red, of Overly Sarcastic Productions, brought this up briefly in a recent detailed diatribe about the multiverse problem. Red claims that modern comic book readers will only read certain runs by certain authors because they trust those authors to write fun and creative stories while still being respectful to the characters that they're using. I couldn't agree more, because I've been hiding something from you. I hate to have done this to you twice in one video, but I really buried the lead deep on this one. That's right, I've only read like three Batman comics. Batman is still my favorite comic book hero, but I just can't get invested in reading his comics because I know some corporate carpetbagger at Warner Bros. is going to reset everything again within the next few years and make it all seem meaningless. I'd like to try to explain why this might be happening. The folks at OSP talk at length about what the multiverse problem is without ever getting into the why which I think is the most important part when trying to understand the, let's call it irreverent state of our current pop media landscape. Why do the writers keep hitting the break everything button? Because it also happens to be the print Warner Media Group billions of dollars button. Why does every MCU thing nowadays have to be an uninspired boilerplate cookie cutter Joss Whedon quip show? Because that's what funds Mickey Mouse's cocaine addiction, baby! Those South Asian sweatshops can't do it alone. Why can't anything ever be done? Why does everything have to be a reference to itself while being self-referential to the fact that it's being referential to a piece of cinematic iconography that everyone is supposed to have seen or at least know about as a result of cultural osmosis, which in and of itself is a self-aware comedy that actively breaks the fourth wall? Because it's in vogue. Because it's popular. But in a profitable way, not in a way that would improve the lives of actual humans. Unfortunately, this will likely remain a constant in the big media landscape for the foreseeable future. Thankfully, smaller artists are already starting to make headway in a different direction. Just last year, Focus Features, a subsidiary of Universal, produced and distributed The Northman the newest project by indie director Robert Eggers. Now, a studio giving an artsy indie director a shot is nothing new, but if you're at all familiar with Eggers' particular brand of weird, you should know why this is surprising. Despite essentially bombing at the box office, critics loved it, while the majority of audiences viewed it favorably. This goes to show an important shift, as just a few years ago a big-budget studio wouldn't have even considered Eggers let alone give him $70 million. Such a decision should be seen as an early example of the headwinds changing, with big-budget studios willing to pump resources into projects that are a little bit weirder and more surreal. A24, a studio best known for off-kilter independent horror projects, is already starting to become more of a household name off the success of projects like The Lighthouse and Everything Everywhere All at Once. At the same time, it makes sense why the postmodern media landscape exists in the way that it does. After years of turmoil, depression, censorship, economic strife, depression, two world wars, reactions to them, and depression, it's perfectly natural for this weird self-referential fusion to take center stage. Pioneered by artists like Tony Kushner, postmodern art decided to take the grand absurdity of it all and, instead of being consumed by unending despair, laugh in the face of nothing. That's it. Thank you for indulging me. If you liked this or are interested in seeing more, I've got a couple of things you might want to watch. 
right here. If you enjoyed this or have any thoughts of your own on this whole postmodern mess, please let me know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, you know the drill. As always, it is Tuesday. I am Tuesday, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye!